So I think we're gonna show I think we're gonna show y'all a video that nobody's seen yet, nope. right? Very like few premiere. people. It's pretty much done. It's done-ish. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, but a little context of this video is uh, I started a company uh, almost a year ago now with um, with a guy named Paul, who Paul Lays, who's in here over there. And sort of the mission of the company is that um, you know, as I found success on YouTube and in the world of social media, I always struggled to find opportunities to work with companies that were actually creatively fulfilling. Um, there were myriad opportunities being thrown at me, and I think a lot of a lot of people in the you know YouTube world that have a big audience, but they were all transactional. Talk about our product, and we'll give you this much money. And someone who really cherishes the creative aspect of creating that is about as um, about as uninteresting as it comes, borderline insulting. So you know, Paul and I worked together for years on on in various creative capacities, and the, the thesis of the company is like, can we build a company that bridges the divide between the creator world and industry, and at the same time enable creators to sort of figure out how to make a living off of their creativity? And at the core of that, it requires finding companies and brands that we can work with that also share that vision, the idea that transactions are not the way to build meaningful relationships, both with creators and ultimately their, um, you know, their customer base, that it has to be something deeper than that. So this video we're gonna show you guys is, is I'd say it's kind of like, it was sort of an experiment of how we could find a way to yes. work together. It, it was, it was a, a unique way to show like, the, the power of um, people coming together that have a, a shared interest in empowering the next-gen content creator and giving people that would never typically in their life have an opportunity to be able to uh, be exposed to an opportunity that could hopefully catapult their career or give them some sort of uh, motivation to just keep creating and keep continuing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the last thing I'd say before I click play is that you know, Adobe, Adobe Creative Cloud, for someone who creates, it's like one of the things that I always sing from the mountaintops, it's like your cameras, your equipment, the software you use, all of these things are tools to get you to where you want to be. And you know, the, the further we went down in conversations with Adobe, the more we understood just how much Adobe appreciates that, that they're a tool that enables creativity. And the sort of, you know, the mission of our company of 368 is that we too want to be a tool that enables creativity. So there was kind of a perfect marriage there, and that's where the idea that is told in this video, we should probably just shut up and click play, right? show the video. <laughs> it's like six minutes long, so if you guys get bored, just hang in there. <laughs> These are their stories. My name is Joe. I'm 26 years old, and I'm a videographer. Hi, I'm Mariel Harding, and I'm a graphic designer. My name is Caitlin Kemble, and I'm a photographer. Today's Monday. By Friday, we have to be done with this. So you have five days. How I interpret the brand's aesthetic right now is very, like, minimalistic. There's, like, a lot of negative space. What it feels like when I'm being creative is probably the biggest rush of emotion, of confidence, of nerves. I feel kind of shaky when I have like a really, like really, really good idea. It sort of feels like a dream, like weaving in and out 
this almost like unconfidence of, am I even supposed to be doing this? And this confidence of like, I was made to do this. It's been two days. Right now, I'm about to go get sort of a progress update and see where they are in the process. This is, this is great. I love where this is coming from. This is where it starts to fall apart. I like the intent behind it. Mm -hmm. The execution, I don't like. It's way bigger than that. You know, it's hard for me because I don't know what else you have. I'd love to see some more, like, let me catch my breath, show me a big shot. It doesn't communicate that sort of soul to me. Beyond that, it feels dark. It needs a greater sense of ownership. Um, texture. Yeah, and if I had to leave you with one piece of feedback, it'd be keep going. Yeah, so cool. I've got to write those notes down. Sort of feels like I'm back to the drawing board with certain things. It's going to be interesting figuring out, like, do I need to like, start from scratch? Do I trash this? your own point of view is everything. It's just very interesting for me to do this for 368 because I feel like Casey's um, aesthetic is that he likes when things look natural and like I would want to do this. I would always present what you would think. Max, what are your, Max is my favorite editor in the whole world. Max, what are your thoughts here? When you talk about those things, I want to see them. I want to see that this is a place where I can pick up a camera if I don't own one. <laughs> you've got all the clips, mm -hmm. and you've got the VO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to understand yeah, yeah. what 368 is. I don't like to feel pushed or um, pressed. you got to be just very, like, literal. But what I'm I learning is that in these experiences, you kind of are Pressed a lot more. Hey, hey come how's on it going? In. You must be Chantel. Yep. I'm Mariel. Nice to meet you. I just, I really struggle with like working fast enough. Time is our biggest enemy. The it more, is. The more yeah. time you have, the more time you have to overthink things, the more time you have to doubt, the more time you have to be insecure. And when you take time out of the equation, you only have time to be yourself. I'm feeling tired, but I'm feeling good. I've got my idea. I did a lot of work on the computer yesterday, and now I'm just printing it out and kind of putting it up and getting ready for presentation. I'll feel more confident once my light installation is done. I'm a little nervous, because I changed some stuff the, to make it better, so we'll see if it is better. It's been five days. 
You guys have been busting your asses. Super excited to see this. Uh, so this video is called What Will You Create? So you can dim the lights. What we create doesn't stay here. It's way bigger than that. We all create excuses. You know what I'm talking about. I don't have the money. Where do I even start? Four creators. There's almost a euphoria or a spiritual journey that I'm on every time that I make a project. The creator of the universe is creating through me. What will you create? Three, six, eight. I make images because I wish those were the things that I saw in my life. And because I don't, I create them. I think it's most important I learned was not to overcomplicate it. Just start working and something will come. Like trust the process. It's fun watching those other people, right? right. <laughs> Nothing but like weird back and forth with edit notes up until now. Uh, Literally up until last night. Yeah, up until last night. <laughs> um, I feel like I've been talking a lot, but did that movie, for me, for someone who's on the, the sort of like influencer creator side, to see something like that that a company's willing to stand behind and the fact that it's not about the product first, it, it, to me, that that is the, like a really perfect sort of exemplification or manifestation of my thesis when it comes to branding or marketing, which is that you can only ever sell an idea. And if you can sell that idea, people will always buy the product. But you have to sell an idea. And I think that's a really scary thing for most companies. Like, no, 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 more product shots. Like, people don't give a shit. They don't give a shit about your fucking product. So how do you make them give a shit? And that story was, was very true. I think one thing that's interesting about that story that's not even in that story, we literally hired Joe. Um, he is now an employee of 368 because like, that was not an advertising experiment. It ended up being a very real relationship. Um, Caitlin, the young lady, now comes down and photographs every event that we do. Uh, so it, it, there was truth in that. And I hope that that truth is communicated to an audience that will see it and understand what that truth is. And there will be an association there because the only way that we have the tools to do that is because of Adobe's product. And I don't think that that's a lot to ask or a lot to expect from an audience to see, but the kind of relationship that that, um, that, that builds is a, is a much greater relationship than the fact that you know, the product has this many new features or the car has this many horsepower right. in it. Agree. Very cool. So uh, I just want to take a quick second to introduce myself. Obviously, Casey needs no introduction, but I'm, I'm Dylan Conroy. I'm the head of sales for Social Standard. Um, we're an agency that helps brands like Adobe navigate their relationships with influencers. And uh, my client, Jason Ortel, is the head of global social and influencer strategy for Adobe's professional film and video unit. So um, Casey, this was uh, very much like a Bill Murray experience for us, like trying to track you down for two years and get the opportunity to work with you. Um, a couple of like last minute flights to New York, like we, we would get a call and be like, hey, tomorrow be in New York and you know, we'll try and make this thing happen. Um, Casey I made us, he made us work for him. <laughs> really sorry, guys. Oh, the great. video is so good though. Beautiful. The payoff is it always worth, worth it. it. But um, you know, I imagine you get hit up for tons of opportunities and a lot of things come across your desk. 
Um, I'm just very intrigued of like, what was your thought process and this was, why, what, what really appealed to you about this project and why was it one of the few things that you choose to do every year that you sunk your teeth into? Yeah, it's a very simple thing and that's, this is unique to me and I just wanna preface by saying I appreciate that um, I have this opportunity and it's not an opportunity that a lot of people have so I acknowledge that and I, I do but for me, I only like to work with brands and I only like to do the kinds of jobs where I have as much to gain as the company mm -hmm. may have. And that's the trouble with re transactions, is typically it's, the, it's lopsided. I get a check and the brand gets this. But with something like this, like this is a movie I would have made with or without Adobe. The focus might have been something a little bit different, but this is the kind of work that I love to do. And when I think about the handful of brands that I've done work with that I'm truly proud of, um, the work that Paul and I did in years past with Samsung, for example, it was work that was about a, something I care about. It was about a process. It was about the act of creativity. It was about the act of creation. So, you know, I've, I've been a fan of Adobe forever. Adobe has uh, sort of been one of the tools that has enabled my entire career. Mm -hmm. So once I understood that this was sort of the mission behind what was looking to be accomplished, it was a very easy and exciting yes. And just to respond to the Bill Murray, <laughs> just so you guys don't think I'm that much of a Fuck. I, <laughs> no. I, I, um, another position of privilege, but like for me, when it comes to my time, I, you know, still almost every movie I make, I do every aspect mm. of myself. Mm. And I prioritize making my work over everything else. So, you know, starting probably two or three years ago when my YouTube channel really took off, the only thing I care about is making great work. So, you know, no, I typically don't take the phone call. I typically don't take the meetings. I want to make something great. And I think the reason why this came to fruition is as our relationship mm -hmm. started to snowball, I think we all understood this was an opportunity to make something great. That's right. And that's really interesting. That's really rare. But I think it also speaks to kind of the effectiveness of, um, of work like this. I love it. And uh, Jason, same kind of question to you. What was the... You know, Casey was on our radar pretty much right. since day one working with you. What was uh, the Adobe perspective and why you wanted the partnership? So, the thing I wanted, I wanted to completely remove Casey's, you know, audience from this because Casey at heart is a filmmaker. He tells amazing, amazing stories. Um, also, what's really important to us at Adobe is we want to be ethically aligned with, you know, like-minded creators that help tell the stories that we want to tell. For example, you know, diversity, inclusivity, that's a huge thing for Adobe. And everything we do has some element of that. And I know it's really dear to Casey as well. It's, it's ingrained in 368's culture. It's ingrained in Casey's DNA. So we just wanted to make sure that um, who we work with on large projects like this, we just need to make sure that we're you know, ethically aligned, that we all think the same. Another uh, key issue is, or issue. Another uh, reason why we wanted to work with Casey is because you know our philosophy is we want to empower the next gen creator. That's a really important thing for us. And again, you know, Casey's talked about it. We want to give opportunity to you know the young creators that don't necessarily have the means to necessarily live in Hollywood or live in L.A. or, or New York or you know places where these hotbeds of creativity are. We want to be able to use you know, our voice and Casey's voice and expand projects out there and give young creators opportunities that they may not normally have. Were you bummed about the fact that I cut the line where I no. talk about inclusivity? Okay, do you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly okay. which one you're talking about. There was like a lot, like the feedback that I gave Joe, the editor, about his video, there's only guys it, in it. But you don't have to say it, it shows. Well, no, that's, that's exactly <laughs> what I said. In his video, it was only guys. And I'm like, yeah. Joe, there's nothing we do at 368 that doesn't have equal representation, because we wouldn't do it if that wasn't the case. And it's missing from your video. And we had that line in this, and I, it was me that put my foot down. I was like, it has to be cut. You, you said, I, I, I have to see more women. That was the line. That was the line. And I had them cut that, because my general philosophy is, you only show, you don't tell That's right. in that department. So just by saying it in a video, it means that somebody chose to leave that line in there. And if I were to see that, I would call bullshit on exactly. that. It's like, don't tell me that. Show me that. And the video is that. The video, we picked the three best people, but the fact that two of them happen to be um, young ladies, I just think is, mm -hmm. is, was wonderful. But that's, a, that's certainly a, a primary ambition of what we're doing at, at 368, because I think the creator community now 
is one that is wildly diverse. That's and right. If, if you're making content or doing anything that doesn't represent that, then you're not representing the community as a whole. Nice. So um, Casey, your content oftentimes uh, features undiscovered talent. Like that's like a big through line for you is uh, finding up and comers and giving them a platform. Um, that was very much what drew us to you for this particular project. Can you talk a little bit about that importance of like helping the next YouTuber, the next social media creator kind of have a platform and, and, and helping curate some of those relationships? Sure, yeah, I mean it comes from a place of really appreciating how, how much politics can play a role in the world of, of media and entertainment. And I say that as someone who's you know, I premiered two feature films here at Sundance, and I, you know, I worked in television and HBO before I was on YouTube. But even YouTube, it's, it's not always a, f a meritocracy. Mm -hmm. There are always aspects of success in the world of media that go beyond your ability to make great work. Mm -hmm. And I certainly know a lot of creators who are tremendously talented individuals, but selling themselves is just simply not a priority. I mean, you know, this young man, Joe, who's in this video, who's incredible and unbelievably talented, what you don't see in the videos under the table, we're poking him with a hot knife just to get him to speak. <laughs> because he's so humble. And he's, he was so reserved with his talents that he wasn't even comfortable in speaking about his process. Because that's just not the kind of guy he is. So for someone like him to succeed in this space versus a fucking loud mouth like me, it's challenging. <laughs> And I'm also, especially with the YouTube community, I'm a senior citizen in that community. I'm 37 years old, <laughs> and I am the, like the great grandfather <laughs> of YouTube and social, it's the truth. And with time comes experience. So I, I think I do have an understanding of certainly the business of succeeding on there, and also of how to communicate with an audience in a way that actually, things that go just beyond the act of creating something great. So when I meet, which is often, when I meet young aspiring creators who have all their priorities in the right place, which is on solely making something great, I always see that as an opportunity for me to lend some of those other things that I've learned and accrued over time, including a big audience, lend that to them. And then together their great work can, can sort of you know, use my reach as a catalyst to then ultimately share their, their brilliance with the world. And you know, as a creative individual and as somebody who you know, I used to ride my bike around New York City with DVDs in my backpack handing out videos because YouTube <laughs> didn't exist then. It's, it's, it's probably the most gratifying aspect of my career. And certainly like, you know, when, when starting 368, we started, we sat down and we're like, this is what we want to do. How can we actually institutionalize this process of finding young aspiring creators who don't exactly know how to navigate this big scary world of media and how can we help them? And that's where we started. Um, so it's, it's something that's core to everything I do and believe in, uh, and it's, it's, it's something that makes me very happy to continue to, um, to embark on. Nice. I have a quick question yeah, follow please. up to that. So um, when you meet these young creators, I think you know, storytelling is the core of everything. You know, for us at Adobe, we, you know, we create creative products that enable people to create and tell their stories better. You know, it's, it's not about the tools, it's about what's in their head, it's about their story. We just have, you know, just happen to have the tools that allow them to create something to share those. So when you're meeting with young creators, are you finding that a lot of them do have a story to tell? And what, what would be their hang up if, for them to get the story from here to where we can, we can all see it? Um, well, I think like, just a just to give Adobe a little pat on the back, I think <laughs> what companies like Adobe, um, companies like YouTube, mm -hmm. have done so successfully is they've removed a lot of the more tangible obstructions between the process of, of ideation and actually creation. So, you know, like when I was a kid, like there was, until iMovie 1 came out in 1998, there was no way to edit video. I used to cut VHS tapes together, tape them back, and mm -hmm. then put the tape back together with a screwdriver. There was no way to edit video, and now those obstructions are gone. Between a smartphone and your software, like there's nothing that you can't do now, and almost everybody has access to that. So then what I find creators are limited by is their own sort of creative confidence. Um, in this movie here, like, you know, you guys all watched it, but you can intellectualize that to pieces, and where we landed with that is this can't be a movie that's about me. And that's why like, I'm not in it for the first minute. This can't be a movie that's just about these three individuals because who, who cares? Who are these people who cares? 
What this needs to be about is the creative process. And that's even why at that third act, when you're seeing what they made, we really worked hard to take the emphasis off of the actual, off of the actual product mm -hmm. and instead emphasize the process, their learnings. Are far, more, um, are far more important outcome of this process that was that video than what they actually created. So the biggest obstruction that I see for young people is that finding the confidence to navigate that creative process. It's just as terrifying now as it was before, and I think people are scared of, of you know, uh, putting themselves out there. Mm -hmm. I think people are scared of, of doing something that maybe hasn't been done before. Um, you have to cut me off, so I'll keep going forever. But <laughs> Chantel Martin, who is beyond a, a very close friend, she's one of my favorite artists in the world, built a fantastic career with just a marker. Um, just a marker. She's the young lady who's drawing the lines in there, sort of our expert. She talks about how time is the enemy of creativity, because you can get time to talk yourselves out of your, the things that you enjoy doing. And I think that that is so well articulated by her yep. as something that people are scared of. Creativity is an introspective process. Like There is no good or bad in creativity. It's purely objective. So then what becomes the arbiter of that objectivity? And it has to be you. And I think at the, the midpoint of this video, you see those three individuals, um, Caitlin, Joe, and Muriel, and they're both questioning themselves. And what they're saying is they're like, I don't know if Casey wants this or Casey wants that. And all three of the experts that they spoke to say the same thing. It's like, no, what do you want? Get and out of your head. That's exactly right. And that one thing is very hard for young creators, especially because of the inundation of content between YouTube and like staring at our screens all day. It's just like content everywhere. And it's like, I think it should be like that. Or no, it should be like that. Or what would Casey want it to be? And it's like, you're all wrong. All that matters is that you're making what you think it should be. And I think that that is something that um, especially people who are aspiring, who have yet to find success, find validation in their creativity, they struggle with. Right. They don't know if they're making the right thing. So this will probably be our last question. So um, can you tell us more about why you started 368 and what the long-term vision is? Like, what's it look like two, three, four years out? Sure. I mean, you know, why I started it, I, you know, I, I think I alluded to when we started this talk, but it's, it's this idea that you have this entirely powerful, energetic, new generation of creative individuals, and then you have this whole world of, that this room's filled up with of individuals that are looking to figure out, you know, what does the future of this mean as far as industry goes? Mm -hmm. So can we create something that bridges that gap? And that's sort of the business perspective of 368. Because if we can succeed in bridging that gap, then what that means is this entirely new generation of aspiring creatives will now have a means to realize their creativity. And then this gets to more of the, the kind of the mission of the company versus the business model of the company. The mission of the company is simply to enable creators. Um, very literally, it's like helping creators climb the ladder to success elevator style. Like what's the way of getting off this gruel and finding a way to succeed? So 368 is about providing the tools to those creative individuals to become pros, to be able to make a living off of their creativity. And when you're starting with that, then how do we do that? Then we have to work with companies and brands. We have to work with the places that are, are looking to connect with that kind of creativity. And from there, you can start to see this, the business of 368 snowball. Um, and as long as the business is snowballing, then that mission can also snowball of enabling creators. So a lot of what we do right now at 368 that's not working with business or industry um, is bringing creators together. Uh, just last Monday night, we brought, what was it, Paul, like 150 people? from around the world came around and it was called like creators in real life. And it was like, okay, we're not on social media, we're actually face to face. What are we learning here? What do we need to know here? And I just think that that's something that is scalable. I think that when you look at, I don't know what the number was, but in 2016 study, I think it was 70% of six to 14 year olds in the United States, when they grew up, they wanna be YouTubers. <laughs> not filmmakers, not rock stars, but literally YouTubers. I think it's just, it's indicative of how hungry this generation is to express themselves, but there's still no one out there trying to help them figure out how to do that. Um, so that's what we're trying to accomplish at 368. In five years, it'd be amazing if we had 50 of these things around the country and around the world. It'd be amazing if people thought of 368 as the resource for where they can go to or look to or lean on when they want to figure out how to do more with their creative ambitions. And Jason, uh from your perspective with Adobe, how do we continue to go down that path with KC and 368? 
Yeah, um, Jason, how do we get out of the past? <laughs> well, first we have to sign the paperwork. No, <laughs> no I think it's just, uh, it's just allowing Casey to do what he does best and believing in Casey and believing in 368 and Paul and the amazing team behind it, which we do. We believe in that. Um, it's... Again, it's sharing our voices together that we want to empower the next gen creator. And I think, you know, I'm committed to it. Adobe's committed to it. You're certainly committed to it. Dylan, we work very close together. We're all committed to making this happen. So I see, uh, I see a partnership. I see a, a long-term, uh, you know, relationship that we can pursue because we all have the same goals in mind. Nice. Yeah. I think and Rick's that, gonna, oh, good. I was just gonna say the last thing is like. You know, this, this video was never meant to be, certainly not. We never felt from Adobe that this is what they wanted and from us, this was never our intention. This wasn't to advertise anything. Correct. This was meant to message sort of a partnership that we are two like-minded entities coming together to do a single mission. And I think it's also, out when, you know, we're gonna release it on Monday, but it's going to inspire the, 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 next, gen the, the next creatives that can say, wow, I, could, I can do that. I could be there and now, I know everything is not peaches and cream. You know, there is a creative process that I get told no a lot, and, and I think that's really important for young creators to, to hear and see. What's the line that she says? Okay. Cool. So. <laughs> cool. <laughs> that is the Defeat. creator. Okay. So, cool. That is thank the creative process. Thank you, everyone. Process. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. I think, I think thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we're not going to let you go yet, though, because I'm sure there's somebody here that would love to ask you a question that's not sitting on the stage. Anyone have a question for Casey or Jason or Dylan? I was pretty sure there was. Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. On the process where you have the 1,200, was it a blind process? Or did you see the creators as they were playing? No, so we, use, we leverage social media to reach out. And you know, I posted a video that was sort of a call to action, uh, brought people to a splash page. Splash page had the information of exactly what we're trying to do. And then from there, people came at us. <laughs> People weren't great at following the rules. Right. They attacked on all fronts. So it was a it was a pretty simple ask. It was basically share your portfolio. Nothing new created for 368. Just show us your existing work. Share it on social with a specific hashtag so we can find it. And within three days, we had 12,500 uh, submissions. And people creating videos like we wanted it to be simple so we could sift through it. And it was. It was a daunting, daunting process. And for us, it was about that cross-section. We didn't want children that thought it might be a cool opportunity to come hang out. Right. And we also didn't want professionals that have already figured out the industry. So that's a tricky thing. You know, like, um, you know, Muriel's got a great social media reach, and uh, she's done some really interesting things. And someone like Joe, I think he worked for... Um, like Isn't recording artists, industry, a, yeah. yeah, hip hop artists, and he made some videos for them, but he had to actually make a living off of it. So it was about, we learned a lot by sifting through those 12,000 applicants of what's the kind of person we're looking for. Someone who's both green enough to be open minded, but has found enough success or has done enough to know that they're, to believe in themselves. Not someone who's flirting with the idea of being a graphic designer, but right. someone who has committed their whole life to it. Um, but. I, I can't express how much we learned from that ridiculously overwhelming part of the, pro <laughs> part of the process. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. All right, you guys. Wait, they, this guy had a question. Oh, you got another I, one? Like, <laughs> oh. I already made eye yeah. contact. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> creators being, you know, young, youthful, you're 37 and inspiring me the same age. How do you, you know, I get sometimes I get inspired to start now to be a creator. I'm not an apple for me to share on social media stuff, but like, what would you Um, as, as we're not the youthful creators that we're all looking at, but what can we do if, if we have that itch to be, to be more creative? This is usually when I just sprint out the door. Um, <laughs> that's a really hard question to answer. If I knew the answer to that really well, I'd probably be on my yacht somewhere right now. Um, the, the truth is, I don't know. But my answer is always the same, which is like much like that creative process, if you're looking to what other people are doing, she's successful, so I need to do that. He's successful, so I need to do that. You've already failed. Like, you've failed before you've begun. Um, it has to be something that you individually truly believe in. And before you dismiss that as sort of like a platitude or something you'd read on a poster with like a kitten hanging off of a branch, I look at what's successful on YouTube, and it's like, yeah, there's a lot of like cool 20-year-old good-looking kids talking about stuff and using semantics that I don't understand. But 
there's also like some really weird niches. Like one of my favorite YouTubers, a guy named Doug DeMiro, and he's this kind of like pasty looking, probably 30 something white dude who's not particularly charming or funny, but he's a very honest guy. And he gets a car like three times a week and he's like, hi, I'm Doug. Today we're looking at the Nissan whatever. And it's a 20 <laughs> fucking minute long video. <laughs> But I started watching this guy years ago. I'm like, what's so captivating about this? And I look at his channel now, and by the numbers, he's one of the most successful YouTubers out there. I mean, he's doing you know, 40, 60 million views a month. He's carved out this huge space. He's not a kid. He's not part of the pop culture. He's not someone that you'd see on a YouTube poster. He's authentic. Um, he's, whatever he is, it's sticking with an audience. But certainly when you think of YouTuber, you think of social media success or self-expression, you don't picture a very straight man talking about cars in a way that he's clearly passionate about, but it's also like some, like he's got something that you look at and it would not strike you. But there's an audience for it that I don't think anybody anticipated. And I look at that as sort of a reinforcement of this idea that it has to be something that you genuinely believe in. Because chances are, if you believe in it, there's an audience for it. And that audience can be really small or in the case of Guys talking about cars for 20 straight, a single car for 20, it could be huge. And now this guy's got a fantastic career and you know, I've tweeted at him a little bit, I'm a big fan of his, but I would venture to say that it's, his success probably surprised him. Um, so I, I, nobody knows anything in the world of new media. Um, there's no sort of, uh, and the, the metrics don't lie, which is really painful. There's no for bullshit Nielsen ratings on YouTube. There's just one really mean number. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, it often speaks truths. So mm -hmm. therefore, like you can't, you know, you, you can't do the kind of testing. You can't do the screenings. You can't. You're so right. From our standpoint, when we look at creators, we know it when we see it. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's no secret sauce. It's we know it. We, you just, it's something you feel. It's just, you know, it's about putting yourself yeah. out there. It's about, yeah, it's about, yeah, it's just about being true to the sort of the creative process. But I often, we often mingle the word young and the word aspiring, and I don't think that that's fair at all. I see a lot of creators, a lot of individuals on YouTube that are finding real success. I look at my wife, who's a you know, 40 year old mother of two, and what she looks at on YouTube, and it's, it's, you know, it's women of her age that are also mothers that are sharing perspectives that she cares about. I wouldn't characterize these women as YouTubers, but they're successful on YouTube making videos, so of course they're YouTubers. Um, so the, there is no model for success in the world of social media or new media. And I think that I see that as nothing but like tremendous opportunity across the board. Are there any, do we have so to much. get off the, okay. <laughs> Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you.